You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee in Acumen Law and with me, my co-host, Paul Doroshenko. Hi, Kyla. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, nice to talk to you from far, far away. I'm supposed How's to be- your vacation? How's your vacation I'm, going? I'm supposed to be on vacation, but somehow I'm still doing my podcast. <laughs> well, podcast is not exactly work. I mean, come on. You do this for pleasure and for the love of it. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, (laughs) Some sometimes it feels like a chore. I'm not saying now is one of those times, but sometimes. Well, I do the podcast too, even when I'm on vacation. So, you know, and and I do it because I enjoy it, and I also enjoy the conversation. And half the reason that we did this started with it in the first place was because so often we don't get a chance uh, anymore, like we used to, like six years ago, to talk about some of these things. Remember when we used to go for lunch like three days a week? We had time for that. We did. We used to have time for that. We used to, we had a restaurant right around the corner there. It was called Bogart's. It was great in our old office. It all seemed uh, typically somehow three days a week, we used to go for lunch. Those times are over. Yeah, they are over. Even though we've got a restaurant right around the corner in every direction now. Yeah, I know. Well, I was walking to a restaurant the other day uh, and um, I was almost run over by somebody who was on their phone and didn't see the stop sign. And I was crossing. I had a, you know, the right of way because of the stop sign. And I was going to a restaurant I don't normally go to because I wanted a burrito because I've had burrito in my head for the last few weeks since I released that song. Uh, And uh, I did have the burrito afterward, but I was quite shaken up. It's quite shaken up anyway so maybe i'm scared to go for lunch now you had a burrito again just just was it today you sent me a video that was yesterday yeah i had another burrito i've just had burrito in my mind i went up the road today um and uh looking for a burrito i ended up going to a restaurant that had tamales and i have to say i don't really care for them it's the first time i think i've ever had them yeah um yeah i had them at that restaurant and I, I have to say, it's probably not my thing, but I can understand why people would enjoy them. Well, they have tacos there, so I might go back, but no burritos. So a little disappointed. I wanted my burrito. I just wanted my burrito. All right. Moving on to our actual topic this week is not somebody who just wanted their burrito, although maybe that's the explanation behind all of this, but it is yet another crash into an overpass in the lower mainland but this time a little bit different because the driver just abandoned his truck and fled the scene yes and of course all of those things come to mind why does somebody leave the scene of an accident um and uh, of course again now we have in bc if you're listening outside of bc this has become so common that the provincial court the provincial government now has a website to track it where you can see when that took place and what happened uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and and there's a lot of them like there's a lot of them surprising and the one that took place on uh, i was on mike smith's show this morning this is thursday evening um, and we were talking about it and the one on, uh, just, uh, south of the night street bridge there in Richmond, it hasn't been repaired yet. And that was months ago. Well, this one apparently didn't cause any structural damage. Well, that's good. Save him a lot of money because he could be on the insurance hook, bearing in mind he left the scene of an accident. Well, and also, um, you know, there's the BC government suspended the entire fleet's license yeah i suspect that was probably because they had some previous things that were likely concerns uh and on top of that um in this case apparently well they're not they're not assisting the investigation by saying who the driver was if it were my fleet and my driver did that and left the scene i would be like nope no you didn't absolutely yeah 
you know, I'm turning you over to the police. You damaged my truck. You damaged my reputation. You're going to cause my fleet insurance to go up. The driver has the right to silence. He's under investigation by the police. Um, he probably doesn't have that same right with respect to his employer if he wants to keep his job and avoid, uh, you know, potentially being sued by his employer for this. Uh, but the company certainly doesn't have any right or expectation. No, the company does have the right to stay silent and not provide information to the police because they're also potentially on the hook, right? Um, if they are responsible somehow, or they could be claimed to have been responsible by providing inadequate training or demanding, you know, unrealistic expectations. Or Gross negligence, I guess. But I mean, you, I would expect, I would expect an explanation. And the provincial government might, you know, maybe there's the right to silence, but there's also the right of the government to suspend that. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I mean, they can't suspend it as like retaliation, but they can suspend it because there's reason to suspend it, right? They, the uh, RCMP ticketed the company as owner of the vehicle for a hit and run. Yes. Which also, just incidentally, would that not make it, you know, more difficult to prosecute the actual driver? Because I know, like, with a criminal charge, you could have multiple people committing the same offense but it seems like with with a violation ticket offense or a motor vehicle act offense and this could only be a ticket right they didn't hit a hit a car they didn't hit another person it's not a criminal so, code one no yeah. it's a motor vehicle act charge so the motor vehicle act seems to contemplate that it's either the driver or the owner who is ticketed and not both yes and I was thinking about that too. I don't think that they can. Uh, I don't think they can ticket the driver now at this point, or lay um, a crown information. The, but but they could lay a criminal charge for something like public nuisance. I think it's probably more likely something along the line of a one forty four one a. And I think that uh, one in Richmond could have been a one forty four one a as well. How can you not say that this is not driving without due care and attention with respect to the one that had the the uh, box open? In this case, it was apparently an overheight container. You know, if you're driving an overheight container to an underpass that you should very well know is the right is not the right height, you're not showing the care and attention necessary of a driver in those circumstances. I would convict somebody on that basis if I was a judge. Yeah, fair. That there's, yeah, I I could see the argument, but I think you could you could easily get to a criminal offense here, and I wouldn't be surprised if charges were laid, criminal charges were laid under something like a mischief or a nuisance, um, be, to make an example of this person. I don't see it happening, uh, but I was thinking of uh, all sorts of things that arose in my mind in the last little while. You know, we have mandatory ASD demands and mandatory ASD demands are limited by the provisions of the criminal code that spell out what has to take place. Right. A police officer pulling you over. And that is to minimize the charter violation, uh, the 10B right to counsel violation. Well, you know, I think you could justify an exemption written into the criminal code, for example, where you have, say, a school bus has been in an accident. Even if you don't have a reasonable suspicion, it seems to me that a person who's driving a like a, a vehicle in those circumstances should be uh, subject to an ASD sample. So if you're a police officer and you show up, for example, at this case and the, say the driver's there right? Mm -hmm. um, you show up after the fact, you know, you don't have a reasonable suspicion that there's alcohol in the body. You can smell some alcohol in the vehicle, for example. You can't make a mandatory breath demand, but should you not, because he's a commercial driver uh, with a commercial vehicle who's just been in an accident and who it should presumably be working, right? Should you not at that point have some lawful authority as a police officer to take an ASD test? I'm speaking for the other side here, right? But yeah, I, I was just thinking about it in this case. Like, I, I just think that that there's a different obligation to people who are driving 
commercial heavy vehicles for work or school bus operators. And for two decades, I've been advocating interlock devices in school buses. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic about the thin edge, like seeing a, an Australian style um, approved screening device system where everybody has to blow at any time the police officer demands it. But you would think that in circumstances where you've got somebody driving one of these very special big vehicles, that if there is a collision and the police show up, that they shouldn't have to go through those steps of trying to, you know, identify enough information to form a reasonable suspicion. Right. I think a, a criminal code amendment to that effect would make sense. And I think it would be an easy sell. Yeah, it's definitely an easy sell. It's hard to find like a, a legitimate argument against it other than the, you know, sort of government creep into private spaces. But if you're engaged in commercial driving, that's a highly, highly regulated activity. Driving is highly regulated to begin with. But when you're doing it commercially, you're regulated by like the federal government in Transport Canada. You're regulated by provincial regulations. You've got your your commercial vehicle safety enforcement branch. You've got your fleet requirements. I don't know. I, I, I'm ready to write my own private members bill. The only problem <laughs> is I'm not a you know member <laughs> member. I'm not a member of parliament. There's two private members bills I'd write. Uh, it's the eight ten provisions for people who are in the uh, public realm, and the and and the mandatory. ASD sample post accident uh, for school buses or heavy trucks. Yeah, well, there you go. All right. Speaking of ASD samples, you were telling me something very interesting before the podcast, which was about some sort of dating. Well, you and I have noticed this before, right? In yeah. years where there's forest fires, we see ASD refusal cases go up. Mm -hmm. And in certain types, times of the year, particularly when it's cold we see the number of ASD refusal cases we have. Mm -hmm. And these are cases, not equivocal refusals, where people just say, fuck you, I'm not going to blow. They're mm -hmm. cases where people put their mouth on the thing and blow, and they can't, you know, they don't get a uh, reading that, um, you know, it, it doesn't capture their sample. They don't meet the parameters for the flow sensor in it to trigger the device to capture the sample. Right. And... Um, this year, because of the forest fires, uh, we noticed in certain parts of the province in particular, uh, again, you know, a slight spike in ASD refusal cases. Yeah. But actually, the summer, much of the summer since the fires started. And uh, I started reading into it a little bit and, and looking into it. And it's never been something that was studied. You know, there's one thing, there's normal breathing, right? Uh, and then there's, you know, exerted breathing and and very strange breathing like trying to provide a sample of your breath into an approved screening device which is abnormal breathing mm -hmm. um and uh you know there's all these warnings about if you're out in the smoke you know you may have chest pain for days you might have um you might have coughing and wheezing uh yeah. and all of these things go up during uh uh, during forest fire season and it's not well studied apparently you know all the all the discussions i found this summer and there's tons of articles that showed up this summer because of the forest fires not just affecting us in bc affecting alberta manitoba much of the united states so much smoke from canadian forest fires um going down and affecting people all over the place there's tons and tons of discussion about the fact that there isn't a lot of study of it and the particulate matter that they were talking about from forest fires in, you know, the, the actual thing that happens from forest fires is the particulate matter actually clogs your lungs, mm -hmm. can pass through your lungs into your blood. Your body recognizes it as a foreign substance, but it's not, and it, and it will react to try and get rid of it, but it's not a virus. So it doesn't right. know how to get rid of it. So it's not and we don't have a whole lot of great processing skill in our body to get rid of it. And it can go through the blood brain barrier. So you can actually end up with brain particulate death. matter from forest fire smoke in your brain. I did. I was reading about how like forest fire <clears> smoke <throat> can damage your cognitive function. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's 
fascinating because we've got, you know, there's all of these unexpected, all of these people out there right now, ax the tax. And I keep thinking, Jesus, you know, I, we're, we're collecting so carbon gonna, tax and we're paying it back to people who can then afford to, you know, buy the gas that they want, right? Um, continue to drive the big trucks or what have you. Meanwhile, like that money that we're collecting in carbon tax is going to have to go to pay for the health care uh, concerns for it. It's going to have to go to pay for putting out forest fires. Um, and it's going to have to to deal with all of these other aspects that, it, you know, and here we have yet another um, thing connected to climate change. And that is people getting, despite the fact that they're trying to provide a sample, not able to provide a sample and ending up with immediate roadside prohibitions as a result of it. So is it time or some other criminal code charge for not being able to provide a sample? Since you're putting together your private members bill, is it time to write something into the criminal code about about not charging people with refusals during forest fire season? <laughs> well, um, you know, as I've said before, we have this manual for the uh, Alco Sensor 4 DWF, which is the approved screening device here in BC. And nowhere in that manual, year after year, they publish that manual. Nowhere in that manual does it contemplate people with a disability mm -hmm. or people who have some medical condition. This could be considered a medical condition, even if it's temporary, or people who have some other condition exacerbated by forest fire smoke. And police officers are basically taught to lie in their reports and to try and come up with some sort of explanation justifying the fact that the person didn't blow. Meanwhile, you've got all of these people who attempt to blow and they blow enough that there's a status message. And half the time you get multiple different status messages because they're trying to blow and not trying to and they continue blowing, blowing, blowing. And then they end up with a refusal, despite the fact that, you know, the they've got a very legitimate reason that it doesn't accept it i mean it can be a malfunctioning device it may be a, a issue of they've been exposed to forest fire smoke could be uh, that they have a cold they have a cold any other illness i mean we do know. see refusals go up in cold and flu season well you and i have noticed that before and the question is, is it cold and flu season or is it because it's cold out? You know, we've noticed when it's cold out as well, people are just cold and they're holding their body so tightly, they seem to have more trouble providing a sample. There's, there's a ton of research in into the effects of cold on your lung capacity and lung capacity can be diminished up to 20% if you are cold because the blood vessels in your lungs constrict, making it harder to take in a deep breath. But then again, all of the uh, police are always taught, oh, yeah, you can have a third of a lung and still provide yeah. a sample. I don't know where they're taught that. It's not in any manual, but they, they just keep rounding repeating up things all like that. With, with living on a portion of a lung and, and bringing them in to prove it, right? Yeah. I was talking to uh, one of the expert witnesses that we use today about assumptions in breath testing versus things that were actually studied. And there's so many assumptions in breath testing. Same with like, for the example, here's, here, here's an example, uh, 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 assumptions in blood testing. So we know that it's an issue when you draw blood from somebody, if you wipe it with alcohol. Um, and there's quite a few people who discuss it, but there's not a whole lot of studies out there about it. And from the state's perspective in the US and in Canada, Forever, police officers have been taught, oh no, that's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. It's not gonna, you're not gonna have alcohol there. Well, it's kind of an obvious issue, really, uh, mm -hmm. because you swab it with alcohol, isopropanol or ethanol, whatever, you know, you're drawing that in, you're gonna have a fairly high concentration. But the you know, sort of the one study about it that everybody refers to is not a study, it's just a, a nutball from the US who was since prosecuted um coroner who just came up with a theory right but it's it's made it probably into so much material out there that it's hard to turn that ship around yep which is super cool that we're relying on that science in our labs <laughs> yes things not studied that are just assumptions every once in a while somebody comes along and and will call into question something but for the most part it's even when they do try and turn that ship around 
yeah. especially when you've got, you know, 5,000 police officers who have been indoctrinated in this mm -hmm. and it's in all the police manuals. Well, and let's not, you know, they're not going to go change the police manuals as the science develops. Let's not forget that all of the labs are run by the police, right? Like in, in Canada, it's an in Canada. Lab. Yeah. So, so you're, you're not getting some sort of independent assessment of, of information. You're getting people who in are. You're getting inbreeding, inbred mm -hmm. information. The police, the police favorable science to train them. Yeah. And nothing but. Yeah. Anyway, uh, one wonders how we're going to deal with it. Uh, you know, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a refusal case and you're in a, uh, smoky location. I'm just wondering, maybe you can sue the BC government for failing to properly maintain the forests or no, failing well, to have adequate forest fire coverage. The government set um, the fires. What's you, that? Don't you know the government set the fires? Oh, okay. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, that was it. That was in Alberta, not in BC. No, this is a was, real. They were. Theory. They were. They were. They were socialist operatives to try and. <laughs> To try and to try and and advance a agenda about uh, about a so called um, climate change. Well, it because it's not my Dodge diesel truck that's doing it, <laughs> and thousands of others. But it's yeah. not. I mean, it's a bunch of other things too, right? It's concrete production. You know, we 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 half the BC economy is forestry. The other half is concrete production to build condo towers. Concrete production produces tons and tons and tons of CO2. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. What are we going to do? I guess we could all just live in hand-built hand huts. Okay, so moving on to something completely <laughs> different. I wanted to talk about this interesting issue that has been going on with Handy Dart in Vancouver. So Handy Dart, yeah. for those who don't know, is the bus service for people with disabilities. And they can essentially call up the handy dart and the handy dart will come to you and take you where you want to go. Because if you are physically incapable of getting to the bus stop or it would be very difficult to get to the bus stop, <clears throat> the bus service should be available to you at your door. Yeah. And in particular, the fact that we do provide a bus service and it's discriminatory, essentially, to uh, yeah. not provide it to people who can't make it to the bus stop and because of a physical disability. It is taxpayer subsidized. The bus. Heavily. I mean, it's mostly paid for by taxpayers. So TransLink, apparently, has been sort of not providing the handy dart service and has instead been engaged in what some people say are a surge of, of using taxis. Essentially, TransLink saying, we don't have a handy dart for you we'll just call a taxi to come take care of our obligation to you. Well, and you think about that, that actually makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, it can be a lot cheaper. You can provide good, quick service. You know, you might be waiting two hours for a handy dart, right? You sometimes you have to book well in advance, but to get a taxi, you can get it more quickly, provided the service is going to be provided. Right. And provided properly. And there have been numerous instances in which riders are getting injured, getting in and out of taxis because they're not having their wheelchairs properly secured, or they're not being given from the taxi drivers door-to-door -door assistance, which is what the handy dart is supposed to provide. It's supposed to take you directly to your door, and that includes like physically taking you to your door if necessary. And, and with, which a pretty reasonable expectation when we're talking about people who are disabled, right? Yeah, there was a a an instance that a, a mother has shared about her daughter who's nonverbal, um, who was in a taxi and was not escorted to her front door afterwards, went the wrong way, wandered across the highway, and got lost for hours which required the police and a helicopter to come find this poor little girl. Can you imagine the trauma for her? Not the mama, for the, for the poor little girl. Like you can't communicate to anybody in a way that they're going to understand what you need. 
Yeah. Yep. And uh, apparently, it's statistics from uh, a guy named Eric Doherty, who's a transportation planner and researcher. He found out that 17% of handy dart requests are being fulfilled by taxis. You know, it, it it might be that 17% can be and safely be, but the problem is, are yeah. they equipped to deal with these circumstances where they're not? And, and Translake had also previously made a public commitment to bring their taxi use down to essentially fund more handy darts. They were trying to get to 7% by 2021, but instead it went up. Yeah, I remember this being an issue about 15 years ago. Again, there was a similar incident. Um, if somebody left outside, couldn't get in their home in like the rain or the snow. Um, and, um, you know, it was it was scandalous for a one day story type thing, but it was enough that you thought the government was going to ensure that it was properly funded and regulated to make sure that didn't happen again. And then here we are. And one wonders, as I say, you know, if it's whatever the percentage is, one person, it's wrong, right? You do this to one person, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally, 100%. We're talking about vulnerable people, right? Vulnerable people. Yeah, it's awful. Well, it's potentially a human rights complaint against uh, TransLink. It's potentially a lawsuit against TransLink. Yeah, quite and likely. Theoretically, the police could sue TransLink to recoup the cost of getting this... Putting a helicopter up. Yeah, getting this search for this this kid. So there's there's a lot that could come from this. But do you know what I don't expect to come from this, Paul? Um, um, well, I, I can guess, but I think you want to say it. What is that? Meaningful change. Okay. What did you think? You of? don't expect meaningful change. No. Um, I, you know, uh, I know how big organizations work because you and I deal with some of the biggest organizations in government, right? Mm -hmm. Um, ICBC, uh, uh, superintendent of motor vehicles, crown council, courts, um, trying to get any of those things to change and improve. Um, it's disturbing how hard it is and how ineffective it is. Uh, it was lovely at the start of the pandemic to see change being made with like good decision just right there and none of the naysayers standing in the way because they couldn't. And I thought, oh, God, if we could just keep this going, but I know it won't last. I know it'll end up, you know, falling to a committee that can never make a decision. And uh, I just don't expect, uh, I don't expect much as a result. Yeah. I'm with you, my friend. But I did mention a potential of a lawsuit against TransLink. Yeah. And I think when we talk about lawsuits, Paul, Sometimes we talk about people who legitimately have good reasons to sue, like discrimination. And then, Absolutely. And then sometimes we talk about people who don't have such good reasons to be suing. Like? Like the ridiculous driver of the week. The week, the week, the week, the week. A surprising bestseller? The pinpoint method of cross-examination is catching on. Law firms and new litigators across Canada have caught on to cross-examination the pinpoint method. Kyla Lee's straightforward handbook that teaches you effective cross-examination skills. All so right, this, let's this, hear all about it. This is a guy who, I guess he like died because- well, So he can't be suing. Somebody's well, suing. Yeah, his estate is suing because this guy died because Google Maps had not updated its map of some location in 10 years. And he's following the map and there's supposed to be a bridge, but there is no bridge. And so he drives off basically a cliff and dies. So you're thinking to yourself, usually when the bridge is Sorry, is I'm, out, I should stop. Um, either I the road ends, like they... What's that? 
I said, I shouldn't laugh. The guy's dead, but like. Well, it's a ridiculous lawsuit, really. Um, you know, the yes, Google puts these maps out there. And I think there is a legitimate issue there to be made that people rely on them and understandably so. Um, but, um, you know, by the same token, like you, you're also supposed to look at the road ahead. Uh, yeah. You've seen people who have driven down like subway entrances because they think this is their turn on their on their with their map program. Well, if you're driving with a paper map, you could also make the mistake. Um, but, although I doubt the map program is directing people to drive down into the subway. Um, you know, you, your obligation is still to look at the road ahead Google and map. not drive down the subway. All these map companies have a disclaimer that's like, you know, you're still responsible to exercise caution about where you're going and follow all of the laws. Yeah. Well, uh, it's unfortunate. I don't know that it's as ridiculous as as um, as it could be. I think there is a legitimate point to be made there, um, whether or not they succeed or end up just settling out. You know, in Canada, when you die, it's not worth a lot of money. Um, in the States, when you die, it can be worth quite a bit more money than it can in Canada to the estate or the family or the children or what have you. Um, but um, I just think the, the intervening act of the person operating the vehicle is really the issue to me. That's me. Yeah. I I just think it's, I, I think this lawsuit is ridiculous. But I also think Google will probably just settle because it's cheaper. Well, sometimes, you know, companies push back on principle and end up paying 10 times more than they would pay have they had they um just settled it out at the beginning and it's a it's a funny thing i guess there is um, a reason for google know, to push back in the sense that anybody who was injured because they listened to the map instead of using their common sense could sue them and it might set a precedent well that's why they wouldn't want to lose it but if they think they're going to win it they might want to push back for the sake of winning it, even if it costs them more than a settlement would. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So, uh, you know, it might be, uh, it might be something, might be a lucrative lawsuit in that sense. Uh, yeah. That Google doesn't want to set that precedent, uh, or Google might look at it and say, you know what, we want to push back hard because we want to set that precedent. Uh, or they might do the a rational thing and say, economically, it doesn't make sense to do this. Um, that's usually the best thing to do when you're sitting there looking as a business, you know, the issue is as a business, you're supposed to be making money, not digging your heels in and getting angry. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes better judgment doesn't prevail. So we should keep an eye on this and see what happens and we can, well, we may never know, but we never we'll, know. we'll, we'll keep a, an eye out for it, I guess. But Paul, I hate to inform you of this, but it's gone and it's gone. That's our podcast. Wow. Well, enjoy the rest of your vacation. I'm so sorry that we interrupted it with a podcast. I'm uh, greatly appreciative of the discussion, however. And yeah. uh, I can say that we miss you in the office and um, that uh, it's very difficult there without you to get uh, the same volume of things done. But I still managed to... Uh, to uh you know wrap up all my hearings this week and do a good job only a few more to go well i i i like to think that i go on vacation uh a couple times just to remind you how important i am <laughs> to functioning well things. i should take a i should take a vacation then maybe one day remind you how important i am does anyone happen. Who to this podcast remember when paul went to went to his cabin in the woods yeah and i conducted hearings every day every day how many hearings have you conducted no you've just answered 80 emails every day yeah on your vacation yeah yeah we never get a vacation folks it's uh we're lawyers anyway nice to talk to you enjoy the rest of your trip
Thanks for tuning into our podcast. If you have a driving law related issue, you can find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com or give us a call at 604-685-8889 and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law.